quiz. For the past year, a high school student has been molesting an eight-year-old that they found. In a just world, how should this end? A. Police intervention. B. Double suicide. C. A fairy tale ending wherein the high school student and their newly acquired love golem can get it on in peace happily ever after. Or D. The Treaty of Tripoli, 1797. If you picked C, congratulations! You've been fooled by Happy Sugar Life, one of the more interesting experiments and sympathetic characterization to come out in the last year. Sato Matsuzaka is an unambiguously evil person, and the fact that anybody would be able to root for her success for even a moment speaks to the quality of Happy Sugar Life's writing. This kidnapping, pedophilic, arsonist, sexual assailant with a kill-death ratio that rivals most professional Overwatch players would be an almost comically evil antagonist in any other show. But but Happy Sugar Life somehow manages to convince the viewer not only that she's kind of okay, but that they should root for her to succeed for 12 episodes, even when they know from Act 1, Scene 1 that nothing is going to be alright. But how, Bryant? How could I have sunk so low as to want to watch this adorable pseudo-couple escape justice and flee abroad where they can engage eternally in unimpeded lust? Well, let me tell you. First off, Sato Matsuzaka is by no means the worst person in Happy Sugar Life, and having other monstrous facsimiles of human beings to which we can compare her makes her so-called relationship with Shio seem almost noble. Most notably, the adults that we see in the first two episodes are overblown representations of Sato's own negative character traits. When Tayo confesses his feelings for Sato, her manager's jealousy and possessiveness leads her to rape Tayo in an attempt to make him realize his proper place in her kingdom of love. This is a mirror to Sato's own possessiveness of Shio, only blown out of proportion in order to make Sato's personality flaws seem less extreme by comparison. Sato herself admits this in her dialogue with the manager. There are a few times when she criticizes the manager in ways that could equally be applied to herself, such as when she says, you shouldn't go after underage kids. But she goes on to say that she controls herself and wonders why the manager couldn't do the same. Here, we see Sato making a direct comparison between herself and someone who does the same thing as her, but worse, which lets the viewer see her as less bad and paints her as a hero for calling out a literal child rapist. But then, when she tells Tayo to be careful because, quote, women have a strong desire to keep people to themselves, unquote, Sato acknowledges her own sin, strengthening that link and reminding the viewer that no, stealing children is not fine, even if it's arguably less bad than literally raping people. Then there's the teacher in episode two, who fits a more traditional and obvious definition of a child predator. He's a skeevy adult who holds a direct position of authority over his would-be prey. He stalks her and approaches her in a back alley, has a flashback about smelling her clothes and talks about all the way he wants to sharpen his pencil in her cubbyhole. He admits to cheating on his wife because he wants to love and be loved by a variety of women and then tries to compare himself to Sato by saying that they've both had sex with a lot of different people. Naturally, this is an unfair comparison since Sato was single at the time and Sato calls him out on that, but more importantly, she calls him a masochistic pervert and a man drunk on his own lust who shouldn't compare himself to her. While the teacher revels in the impropriety of his dealings, Sato at least believes herself to be an equal partner in a relatively normal relationship that society is trying to tear apart for no reason. And even if that mindset could earn her a PhD from the Ken Ham School of Self-Delusion, it nevertheless gives the viewer a point of contrast between her relatively innocent exploitation of Shio and the teacher's knowledgeable and intentional predation of her. There's even a physical disconnect between Sato and the people she would consider to be the real bad guys in the series. Just look at these pictures and tell me that this adorable little nondescript animal girl thing is supposed to be the worst of the three. Sato is cute and brightly colored with a clear face, big eyes, and a generally happy disposition. Compared to the teacher and the manager, who even when they aren't intentionally being drawn to look like this for dramatic effect, seem tired and distant or demanding and stern. This even extends to Asahi, the supposed hero of the story. Put these two teenagers side by side and tell me which one you would want to watch your kid, the smiling sugar girl made of maple syrup and crayons or the beaten up, homeless looking broken condom consolation prize. Just by being a cute girl, Sato has an inherent advantage when it comes to gaining sympathy from an audience. People have a psychological predisposition to see good personality traits in attractive people and bad ones in unattractive people. It's called the halo effect, and Happy Sugar Life uses it at every turn to get the viewer to want Sato's obviously evil child 
child-stealing life goals to succeed. In fact, without the Halo effect, this series wouldn't even be able to get off the ground. Imagine a version of Happy Sugar Life where everything is exactly the same except that Sato is a buff 30-year-old dude with a receding hairline and face tattoos and a knife. In this version of Happy Sugar Life, the implicit goodwill that Sato wins from the viewer by virtue of being a cute anime girl is thrown out the window and replaced with an instant sense of and that comes from witnessing child abuse. As an example, I'm going to show you one of the cuter scenes in Happy Sugar Life, once as it was originally shown on television. <laughs> and once where Sato is replaced by this hypothetical dude. So, Shio chan no kame toi takeru. Hmm. Not the most settling thing in the world, is it? And that's the point. Even if it shouldn't make a difference, Sato's gender and physical appearance are huge factors in determining how the viewer reacts to this show's premise. Take any of the bathing scenes as another example. If anime is to be believed, then bathing with a small child of the same gender is a relatively normal thing in Japan that nobody would bat an eye at if not for the other circumstances surrounding Sato and Shio's relationship. That would not be the case if Sato were any description of dude. This would not fly. And a show with this as the premise would have to be crazy good to get past the inherent squeakiness that comes from a man romantically pursuing a small girl child. As a woman, Sato is able to tap into deep cultural stereotypes that she uses to her advantage in gaining sympathy from the viewer. Women are gentle. Women can't be sexual predators. Women are good with children. Whether these statements are true or not, and they mostly aren't in Sato's case, they are ingrained cultural biases that I can only imagine are stronger in Japan. And those biases make it significantly easier to see Sato's actions as benign rather than deeply and lastingly harmful. With all this talk of rapists and molesters, it's important to note that Sato is not that. I mean, she is that, but not with Shio. I mean, she is a sexual assailant with Shio, since the two of them kiss at least twice on screen, but there's a difference between between this chaste kiss on the lips and being a full-on rapist. Due to Sato's upbringing, she has a pretty large mental disconnect between the action of sex and the concept of love to a point where she seems to believe that the two of them are incompatible. Not that she believes sex is bad in and of itself, just that it either has nothing to do with love or implies a lack of love. It's the idea of a pure, non-sexual relationship built on her idea of love that attracts Sato to Shio in the first place. Sato has looked for love love for a long time, and her main tool in completing that quest is the part of her that is her vagina. She doesn't see anything wrong with sex, but she also knows that it hasn't given her any of the lasting fulfillment that she wants. Take a look at the first non-flash forward scene in Happy Sugar Life. Here, we see elements of Sato's search for love before finding Shio. She finds a man, decides to give him a shot, he uses her for sex, and then one or both of them moves on. Shio is a departure from this, and that's a detail that's displayed visually rather than through dialogue. Look at this frame that appears around Sato's eyes after the boy's confession. Vines covered in leaves and buds, but no actual flowers. Contrast it to this frame, which appears around her and Shio when she goes home, where the flowers, and by extension her love, is in full bloom. Her own sexual history combined with witnessing her aunt's polyamorous masochism as a child leaves her with a lot of disillusionment about sex and its place in romantic relationships. Shio, as a prepubescent, allows her to have a romantic relationship that isn't tainted with sexuality. Note the words that she uses to describe Shio. Always cute. Not hot or sexy or bombin' or lit or whatever the kids are saying these days. Her actions, at least in the first episode, are more mother 
utterly than romantic. And even the camera helps to cement this idea that Shio isn't intended to be sexualized. The first glimpse we get of Shio outside the opening flash forward back is a first person upward panning shot from Sato's point of view that starts between Shio's legs and moves up to just below her chin. Unlike most shots of this kind, however, looking at you, no game, no life, Shio's panties aren't visible at all. With panty shots like this, so ubiquitous in anime, focusing the camera between Shio's legs while deliberately obscuring her underwear is like the director visually telling the viewer, hey, I see you. I know what you think this is. Stop that. Stop thinking that. Stop it right now. After having established a few things about Sato that keep her from having to endure the full unrestricted ire that she deserves, it's worth it to talk about Shio herself and how her imprisonment is actually a check mark on Sato's morality report card rather than an X. Shio is better off with Sato than she would be without her. Period. There is no arguing otherwise. If she stayed with her father, she would get beaten half to death every other day. With her mother in Asahi, she would be starving, impoverished, and unwanted. Tayo all but admits that he would rape her if he had the chance, and I don't like an eight-year-old's chances on the mean streets of wherever this is, especially considering what happens to her every time she goes outside. Even if it's only possible through kidnapping, brainwashing, and murder, Sato provides Shio with a warm, relatively safe, caring, and comfortable home, which is more than she's ever had before. As much as I want to root for Asahi and hope that he gets Shio back where she belongs, would she have three meals a day? Her own bed? Shio even says in the fifth episode that she loves Sato more than she loves her family, that she's warmer than her family. When it comes to Shio's well-being, it's hard to make an argument that she should be with anyone but Sato. Shio wants to be there, and as uncomfortable as it is, she's better off there than she would be with anyone else. This leads us to a discussion of Sato's role as a protector and a caregiver. So, Sato is 100% willing to kill people. We know that by the end of the first episode, and we know that she doesn't even think that much about it. Naturally, that's the kind of thing that would turn a viewer against a person a little bit, and maybe make them think that she isn't really exactly good or something. But remember that if Sato weren't willing to kill people, Shio would be straight up dead. The artist, being another example of an adult who exaggerates Sato's negative personality traits, tries to kill Shio out of jealousy, and Sato, in turn, kills him in order to protect her. Which, hey, full points! She has this mama bear personality thing going on where she'll do anything to protect her cub, and even if her idea of what constitutes protection is a bit skewed, it's hard not to admire that. Especially when we get to see the other side of that coin, with Sato pampering, nurturing, and otherwise providing for Shio in a very mother way. Like it or not, Sato is a good partner in a lot of ways. She's also a bad partner in a lot of ways, which could be the subject of another video, but hey, Pobody's nerfed. The last thing I want to bring up here is that it's hard not to root for the relationship's success when we see the pure, unbridled joy that it brings to both of the girls involved. I've already talked about how Sato is good for Shio, but being with Shio seems to be the only thing that makes Sato feel truly alive. The frame I mentioned earlier with the wreath of vines and flower buds around her eyes is a good visualization of how Sato feels in the day-to-day. -day. She ambles through life with no passion, no purpose, mostly waiting to die until Shio shows up. Shio is her light, and seeing the way her entire life catches fire when she's with Shio really makes something in the viewers say that these two should be together forever, especially when we compare her to any of Shio's other potential guardians. Asahi is in a similar position, where his entire life is dedicated to the pursuit of Shio, but unlike Sato, his dependency on Shio's existence is portrayed as desperation, deep longing, and sadness. And when he's finally with Shio again, he feels anger rejection, disappointment. And that's not to say any of these emotions are unreasonable, only that Sato is the only person who seems legitimately happy when Shio's around. Asahi feels vindicated, Tayo feels pure, but only Sato seems to genuinely enjoy Shio's presence in a way that isn't intentionally exploitative. So, Sato is not a good person, and the series never tries to portray her as such. Even so, by convincing the viewer that Sato fits into certain molds where she clearly doesn't belong, Happy Sugar Life is able to make us want her to succeed regardless. It makes us feel that Sato is the best option for Shio, despite being a kidnapping, 
murdering, arsoning, murdering furry. It plays into pre-established cultural stereotypes and uses psychological shortcuts to make sure we don't have an instant visceral reaction to the whole child stealing situation. And it shows us where she's coming from by letting us see what made her the way she is and how that mentality she develops allows her to both desire and to provide for a little girl. In short, it's able to make the viewer cheer on the predations of an active pedophile through good writing. And I love good writing. So, let's have some real talk for a second. Like everybody else who seeks validation by tap dancing in the void of YouTube, I've suffered from depression for basically my entire adult life. It's a lot better now than it used to be, and it's a hell of a lot better now than it was when I first started my channel, but there are still some lingering effects that I'm working on getting past. Namely, I have some pretty bad executive function issues that make it real easy to get burnt out on things, even things I enjoy, like, you know, this. Which is why this happens. I want to get back to making videos every two weeks, and something that I think I'm gonna try to make that easier is writing shorter scripts on topics that I have less to talk about. Maybe more opinion pieces or informational stuff like the MTG video that doesn't require as much analytical thinking. I know that 20 minute long hard analysis is what people have come to expect from my channel, but putting out those long form videos in anything that vaguely resembles a timely fashion just isn't a sustainable business model for me. So I'm gonna try something new, and I'm interested in seeing what you all have to say about it in the comments, so please leave your opinion down below. On another note, to all of my patrons who stuck with me so far, thank you so so much. I could not do this without you guys, and I know that sometimes it must seem like I'm just here to take the money and run, but I promise I'm doing my best. I want to do right by you, and I'm working to put out better content on a more consistent basis. You're the people who let me keep doing this full time, and I appreciate that more than anything. Especially you, uh... Gavin? Gavin! You're my lucky patron for this video, a brand new patron at the $1 tier. Thank you for supporting me and my content. And if you support me and my content and you want to get cool rewards like holding up my clips in my videos and playing video games with me on my weekly Patreon live streams, you can go to patreon.com slash explanation point, link in the description below. Guys, it's been a pleasure, and until next time, this has been Explanation Point, signing out.